Uh, Bartolotta was another experience in, in uh, finding something and sticking through, to it throughout. I found three huge olive jars uh, at uh, Living Green in San Francisco, uh, and I wanted to use them, and one of the things we were supposed to create was the best Italian restaurant in the world. Olive oil is, for me, the basis of Italian cooking. So we bought those three olive oil jars, and then we set about finding uh, the rest of them. It took nearly two years to find them. We found them in Italy, in Greece, in London, in Paris. Um, almost everywhere else but around. I think we found one in LA. The uh, young lady in our office who was researching them made the mistake of entering in a search engine big jugs. Don't do that when looking for <laughs> olive oil jars. So one of the things we do to create this unique vocabulary is we design everything in the room. These chairs are, are um, designed to the room and the hind leg of the chair, if you look carefully, is the hind leg of one of Steve's German shepherds. I spend a lot of time in meetings with Steve and his German shepherds. I draw a lot of German shepherds in my book. Um, so those are they. And the, the biggest olive oil jar, jar, when being lifted into place, had a letter in it that floated to the ground uh, from World War II that described uh, in three pages, for two pages, a woman describing to her husband how much she missed them, how much the children missed them, how they're growing, what's going on in the little village they lived in. The last page was a complete accounting of the household uh, money spent in a request for more money. That's now hanging in the restaurant. Uh, and the crystals hanging from the olive oil jars from the ceiling are crystals we scavenged from the crystal chandeliers in the Desert Inn. So they still contain the ghost of Howard Hughes. One of the challenges, uh, we have five lagoons uh, uh, centered in that mountain. Indoor, outdoor was uh, one of the charges that we decided was one of the best things we could do for our guests. To design this resort from the inside out, rather than most of the resorts we designed from the way they would look from the strip. Bellagio is very important, what the facade looked like, what, how the fountain played to the strip. As a result, the best view of the fountain is not from one of our restaurants, it's from across the street at Mon Ami Gabi. Uh, so this time we decided to, to not do that. We created these beautiful intimate lagoons and we centered our rooms around them. For the one at Bartolota, the challenge was how to light and invigorate a lagoon when you're sitting on 360 degrees of it and not have light shine in the eyes of the diners. Uh, so we tethered these, uh, these stainless steel balls to the floor of the pool. They're like Victorian uh, garden gazing balls, which I love and, uh, and use in landscapes. Uh, and they illuminate the pool without putting any light on them at all. Uh, Alex, uh, the restaurant is my third, is our third uh, five-star restaurant, our second with Alex Strada, an incredible chef. And what we've learned about these great restaurants is they have to be masculine and feminine, and they have to do that in a very uh, kind of overt way. So here you're seeing very masculine marquetry walls in mahogany, very feminine chandeliers. The trimming on those chandeliers, by the way, is Christmas garland from uh, Pottery Barn. Uh, and in the foreground is a double-ended daybed with the hind leg of my Italian greyhound, Bianca. And this was the first piece in my collection for Edward Farrell Lewis Mittman. When they delivered this piece of furniture, and it may be my 400th piece of custom furniture, I was so, um, I was so, um, I had, they achieved over my expectations. That's rare, right, Leslie? when you design something and they actually deliver it. Uh, you're lucky to get your expectation fulfilled, but my wildest dreams beyond went with this, and that established the relationship with them, which is the way I've established the relationship with everybody who does the Roger Thomas collection. So we did a smaller piece for the bench. Uh, in the front hall. This is a table that's designed to uh, go in an elegant restaurant like this for an ADA handicap table. Uh, it's uh, inspired by the Villa Kirillos in the south of France, and the marquetry that you see on the top, that, uh, that octagonal marquetry, that's the Asher cut diamond I wear that I inherited from a close friend. So the masculine and feminine, I was inspired for this room by uh, some uh, a, a ball gown um, by Balenciaga. Uh, that I saw in a Vogue magazine while curled up in an aeroceranin womb chair in the corner of our living room in Las Vegas, nine years old, and I remembered this gown. It was this uh, uh, eccentrically uh, pleated gown, and it had handmade silk roses, and I never forgot those words. Uh, so this drapery is eccentrically hung over windows cut like Baccarat crystal, um, you'll see the hind leg of Paolo, the larger German shepherd, on the back of these chairs that Bill Switzer made for this room. That's the Paolo chair. Uh, and Elaine Wynn always wanted a restaurant that replicated the amazing moment at the Sun Valley Lodge, another experience that our families share. When you arrive in the room and everybody turns to look and you get to make your grand entrance 
and, it's, and all of that fussing and getting ready and fatutsing is worth it. <laughs> so we finally got to create a restaurant that had that marvelous sense of entrance for Elaine. Uh, and again, you see the masculinity of the walls and the ceiling uh, and these very feminine, delightful light fixtures that we created for the space. I create a lot of light fixtures in Venice. It means I have to go and make sure they're right. Uh, and I love Venice. Uh, this is a mirror I've created for places like that that has 24 karat gilded sand, which is masculine, and passementry tassels. So one of the things we do is play with scales. In a private salon privé where the biggest gamblers are, you would think you'd have big crystal chandeliers. Okay, so they're expected, so we're not going to do that. So we covered the ceiling with 75 small crystal chandeliers and just paved it on a mahogany background. The walls are mother of pearl inlaid in mahogany uh, and nail head on uh, mohair plush. We had a really great idea for the nightclub off the casino. We were going to create the VIP haven. It was going to have all these little sections that we could drape off, create all these little special VIP enclaves so that they didn't get bothered by everybody around them. It was such a great idea, nobody came. What everybody wants to do is go to the, the same big party. They all want to be in one room together. We did this room. This is the same room after a 90-day, uh, this is 90 days to have the idea and get it done. Uh, but we got to work with Sean Christie, who's really good at what he does and knows all about nightclubs. And he said, no, everybody wants to be at the same party. And I, we said, so what would be the greatest setting you could have? He said, I want the coolest living room in Las Vegas. So here's the coolest living room in Las Vegas, a ceiling covered with 255 light fixtures that we made out of lampshades, but each one's capable of 1,400 colors. And the uh, light jockey winner of that year's competition, the international, uh, designed the, the light system that goes in them. Trist is another example of great idea, not so, not so good. Trist started as La Bette, a restaurant that turned into a nightclub. Great idea, you can go to a restaurant and just stay on, turns into a nightclub. Horrible. It wasn't a great restaurant, it wasn't a great nightclub, and it didn't bring any money to the bottom line. It was almost a break even. So along comes Victor Dre. Um, we learn what he needs in a nightclub. We develop through great pain. Um, and uh, a lot of this is, uh, is Greg and uh, Marissa are in the room. Uh, as you know, Victor Dre always has a library at Dre's, and he insisted on having a library. And I went kicking and screaming into that idea. So we created this library wall in the back that is a library. It's got books and tchotchkes and all that stuff. We lacquered everything high gloss red, every book, every tchotchke, everything on the wall, <laughs> thus rendering it a work of art and nothing uh, that could be used, uh, and then put these mirrors on it. This went from zero to 40 million in its first year. The cafe that was done by a wonderful firm, they're great friends in New York. We asked them for a French cafe. They gave us one. It's absolutely beautiful, lovely. We didn't like it so much. Uh, <laughs> so we were given, I think, 45 days on this one, an extravagant amount of time. Uh, and we painted all the walls and ceilings. We left the floor. We kept the furniture. We painted the walls and ceilings, that color you find on Amsterdam buildings that is not purple, it's not black, and it's not brown, but it's all of them. Uh, and then, I don't know why, but I designed this extraordinarily difficult to manufacture light fixture. And we actually found someone who would make this quantity for us in 45 days. They didn't know they couldn't do it. We didn't know they couldn't do it. So we jumped in, they did it. Uh, and then that sketchbook that I carry has lots of drawings that I do that are um, uh, synthetic cubism. And we took the drawings from that sketchbook, colored them quickly with Pentel, sent them off to a mosaic maker in New York, and made these huge shimmery uh, wall treatments that lean against the wall.